I wanted to kind of share some best practices that I've learned over the years. Um, and then um, I also want to maybe talk about some design things that apply to both uh, recording the ensemble um, and not only, uh, sorry, as a virtual performance, but also potentially as uh, design things that you can take into account if you're performing live um, and moving forward, et cetera. So when we're talking about a virtual performance, uh, what does that mean? Um, well, for the purposes of this discussion, I, I'm treating a virtual performance uh, not as like a music video, um, you know, so I know WGI, for example, is offering an e-showcase option where you can have multiple camera angles and you can try a lot of different things and different audio mixes. And that that's not really what I'm diving into here. This is more about getting a recording of your ensemble, um, kind of recreating it as if it was just in person, right? So you, you set up your ensemble like you're going to a show and you're recording it with one camera angle. So um, those are the WGI uh, rules for the group competition. And I'm, uh, you know, under the impression that most circuits that are doing virtual things are approaching their group competition in a very similar format is that it's a one take, one camera angle uh, performance that we're trying to record here. You know, I know that a lot of this can get overwhelming. Don't stress out. It's, you know, there's a lot of gear and a lot of little intricacies that have gone into um, some of the steps that I'm describing, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we want to make sure that your students are having a great experience. Um, it's not about the gear and it's not about the quality of recording. It's about the quality of experience for your students. Right. And so that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to capture it in a way that we can share that uh, with whoever it needs to be shared with. So empower your students. Let them know that this is going to be, uh, you know, for, for those of you that this is maybe not um, your strongest thing that you're great at, like a lot, bring the, the students along for the journey and, and um, you know, empower them and, and make this a part of the educational process that it's not just something that you're doing on the side, but embrace it. Uh, and then finally, one little thing that, that um, I always tell this to, to my students and my staff that the, the season is a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? So there's always this feeling of like, you got to get, you got to get it perfect right away. And it's, if it's not perfect, then it's, you know, it's a failure. And it's like, well, what we're trying to do is we're aiming for the, the educational success for the students by the end of the season. And right. And each little competition is a step along the way. It's a part of the master plan. Right. And so, you know, if the first competition isn't perfect, that's okay. Like have a goal. The first Competition, for example, could be our goal is to get everything set up, get out on the floor, get off the floor and not have anything malfunction. Right. Like that's usually the first goal that I give my students for the first show. And then you're building a season that way so that uh, they have a certain expectation on how to approach this. So, yeah, let's uh, just go ahead and jump right into it. Um, let's talk about some of the gear um, that I would recommend using for this. Um, pretty straight ahead, you know, you'll need a camera, you'll need some kind of microphone, um, and you'll need some kind of software. In theory, you could probably just pull out your cell phone, hit record and submit it directly from your cell phone. Like you could do that and chances are it'll actually probably look and sound pretty good. So don't think that that's not an option. That totally is an option, but this is what I wanted to cover is, well, if you want to take it to the next level a little bit or you want to put some care and attention into it beyond just a cell phone recording, what are some of the, the steps that I've taken in the past to, to get a little bit of a better recording? So as far as the camera goes, um, I think a smartphone for most people actually would not be a terrible decision because most smartphones nowadays, you're going to have really amazing technology built in. Uh, the camera is really, really strong. Most smartphones can now record um, 4K. And so if you don't have other resources, uh, I think a smartphone would be totally fine. Um, in the past, I've had, um, for example, I use an iPhone, you know, and my iPhone doesn't necessarily have a super wide field of view. I have an older phone. But uh, I'll be at rehearsal sometimes and I know either someone on my staff or maybe a student has 
like an Android phone and some of those phones have like a really wide camera. So, you know, if, if you were going to go the smartphone route, um, it wouldn't hurt to kind of ask around if your personal smartphone doesn't have a super wide camera. Th there's a lot of uh, smartphones that do that. If you wanted to step it up to the next uh, level, then you can go with a DSLR or a mirrorless camera that has the video capabilities. Um, that's what I use when I'm making recordings. Um, it's just something that I'm, I'm an amateur hobbyist when it comes to photography and, and video. So um, you definitely could go that route if you already have one or if you, you know, um, have uh, boosters or parents that uh, that do this kind of thing. You're definitely going to get a little bit better of a picture. And then finally, um, you know, you can go the route of a drone or an action camera. Um, this is possible, but I would say this is taking it to that next level, um, depending on your expertise and your comfortability. Uh, it's not necessarily required, um, but, you know, I'll just put that out there. I mean, an action camera, I would say your cell phone might actually look better than an action camera. Um, a drone will probably look pretty good uh, and it'll get you a vantage point uh, if you're able to do this outside. Um, so those are just potential options. Um, so just some camera tips, um, you know, use a tripod. That's like my number one tip. Um, I know it's maybe a, a little bit of a, an obvious tip, but I think, um, you know, you, you really, if, if, especially if you want to create a recording that is not distracting to watch, uh, definitely use a tripod. Even if it's with your cell phone, you can get, you know, little, um, clamps that you can screw onto a top of the tripod to hold your cell phone. Um, definitely use something because uh, otherwise it's just going to be hard to watch uh, as a judge. Um, as far as like the lens and the field of view of the camera, uh, you want to be a little bit wider. Um, so if you're using a DSLR or mirrorless, you know, aim for between 16 to 24 millimeters. Uh, 20 millimeters might be that sweet spot. If you get a little further out than 16, like if you get like a 10 or a 12 millimeter, it might be too um, fisheye looking, you know, like when you act, when you use a GoPro and it's very fisheye, you, you may not enjoy what that looks like. Uh, it, it's going to warp everything on the edges. And then if you're, uh, another tip for, if you're using a, a mirrorless or a DSLR, um, if you're playing with the aperture somewhere between F4 and F11 would be good. Actually F11 might be the best just because you want things to be in focus. Um, and you want that depth of field to be way more in focus, right? So if you, for example, you're the image you're looking at right now, this is set at F2, right? So I'm in focus and that is out of focus. So if I put my hand up to the camera, like that's what ends up happening is like all this stuff is out of focus. So, which is cool for cinematic look and for portraits and stuff, but for this application, you want more things in focus. So for sure, put that aperture higher, right? So F11 would be actually optimal to, to make sure that everything is in focus front to back. Um, the recording settings, uh, definitely 4K if you have it, um, just so that later uh, you can zoom in if you wanted to and you're not gonna lose quality. Um, but 1080p is fine, I'm sure. When you go to submit, um, you probably don't necessarily wanna submit it in 4K, you can, but it just, I don't know what the, the size of the video um, is going to be for for all of the different circuits. So um, you probably just want to submit it as a 1080p. But if you have 4K, that means that you can be further back, you can record it, and then you can punch in later uh, and not lose quality. Um, and then the other thing is, I know a lot of cameras will, with the frame rate, uh, you can go you know 60 frames per second or even 120 frames per second, which is all fine. But if you want it to look like natural and smooth, um, you know, try using 24 or 30 frames per second. That's kind of the natural. Um, that's like what uh, people use for uh, just that cinematic look. Right. So if you want it to look a little bit more natural, but for sure, the higher frame rate frame rates, uh, you're going to look a little bit more action. And then finally, get height if you can. I know this one is probably a more obvious one, but. Um, you know, if you're trying to film from, let's say, 10 rows up on your bleachers, that's going to look fine. But if you can get further up 
or even uh, mount your camera up on a tripod higher up somehow, um, the vantage point is just going to be a little bit nicer. And especially for visual stuff, you'll just be able to see what you're doing a lot better. Uh, if you've invested in a floor, you're going to see the design a lot better. Um, it's just everything looks a little bit better. You'll And actually, from a judging perspective, you can kind of actually see what the performers are doing across the entire ensemble way better if the higher you can get with your um, camera angle. Next, uh, we could talk about microphones. Um, so again, I don't necessarily recommend you go out and buy a bunch of stuff, but you know, I, I wanted to kind of talk about a couple different things that some of us might already have access to. Um, you know, uh, the thing that I've used the most that has worked the best for me in terms of recording my ensemble is like one of those little stereo zoom recorders. Um, you know, they, they come in all different sizes, but they even make little uh, smaller ones. And, and I'll show you on the next slide. But those recorders for me work amazingly because they have already got the the stereo angles on the microphones set up um, and their condenser mics. And they're they're kind of made for this kind of application, just like recording something live. Um, and they're not really that expensive. So the quality that you get for what it does is like actually really, really nice. So you don't have to go out and buy a bunch of fancy mics. Um, if you already have an own condenser microphones with your program, you can use those. Um, and, um, but definitely use a stand, get a tripod, um, because you don't want anything to, uh, interrupt the audio at all. And, as most people will will tell you is the to make any video great the the actual video is probably like 40% of it like 60% is the audio in terms of your experience and so if you could get the audio good then the experience for the for whoever is watching it is way higher than if you dedicate all your time to a 4K camera and buying all these lenses but then if the audio is not good it's not going to matter so of the two things, like make sure that you're prioritizing getting really good audio. Uh, and then the fi final thing with settings is if you're going to use a recorder of any kind, I would definitely recommend recording as like a wave or an AIFF um, and not as an MP3 initially, just so that you're getting the best quality possible. It's not being compressed uh, initially. And so that you have some room to work with it later when you're balancing it. Right. And I'm not talking about room to work. Like you're not going to splice things up and you're not going to like, you know, take it to a professional mixing house or anything, but you just want a little bit of wiggle room. Like if for some reason, if the audio recording is a little too soft or if it's a little too loud, you can kind of fix those things a lot better if you're recording as a wave, as opposed to recording it as an MP3. Um, so here's some examples of, of the recorders that I was talking about. So, um, like the, the zoom H one is, is like their entry level model. It's really great. It's really tiny. It's like maybe this big and, um, you can just put it in your pocket and just have it with you. And it's actually like really cool to just have, you know, uh, as a rehearsal tool at all times. Um, and you know, just recording segments and, and showing it to your kids. Um, the next model, the uh, for example, the H4, um, you can't really see it on this picture, but there's actually it has XLR inputs um, on the bottom of it. And so if you wanted to, you could use the microphones that are already built in and you could feed it, uh, for example, a stereo feed from your mixer. So you could record both at the same time. Right. So if you wanted to, for example, uh, record your synths, but also record the front ensemble, um, you can have both audio feeds going into the zoom. So the, I, the, the next model up has some cooler features. And then, um, the third, uh, picture is a set of condenser microphones. So if you have condenser mics, um, and you get two of them, uh, if you set them up in this kind of, uh, it's called a little bit of a X, Y pattern, it's the best way to kind of get a spread stereo image. Um, and then you can, mimic the same thing with if you have a condenser mic that looks more like a, a vocal or an instrument mic um, they make uh, little plates where you can mount them and so um, all of these are options and you 
most of you probably have access to something like this uh, with your music programs. And then finally, software. Um, you know, you'll need video editing software and audio editing software. Um, there are a lot of options. Um, you know, I, I included here two free options, the OpenShot and Audacity. Um, those are readily available online and they they work for both Mac and Windows. So you don't have to go out and bu buy a bunch of software. Again, we're, we're not going to be doing extreme pro level stuff here. This is, you know, really just capturing the recording and trying to put them all together and, and make it presentable. Um, yeah, let's talk about, so that's all the gear portion. Let's talk about the, the recording uh, aspect of it. So for the video, um, this goes without saying, you want the camera to be in a stable position where you can see the entire ensemble. Um, and so, you know, it depends on your gym, right? Like if you're recording in your high school gym, you can get where you can get and it is what it is, right? So obviously you want to try to, uh, I, I mean, in Texas, you guys have amazing facilities for the most part. So I think this probably won't be an issue for a lot of you, but, you know, try to get up and further back as much as you can. Um, you know, if you have a, like a, uh, a situation where you have a catwalk up one story, that would be a perfect place to put it. Just avoid standing like right in front of your pit, trying to film the ensemble. I know that sounds kind of obvious, but like you want to get up and back as much as you can. Um, so some like camera setting things, uh, if you're on your cell phone, you're probably going to be fine. Just make sure that you have, you know, the 4K recording turned on and then you set your frame rate and you really don't have to mess with it too much. But if you're on a DLSR or um, DSLR or a, a mirrorless, um, be careful about the focus. Um, if you're on autofocus, you don't want the lens to breathe, right? Like what it looked like when I moved my hand back and forth. Um, so just make sure you're, you get the focus how you want it and then make sure you're on manual focus. And then a couple other little, um, setting things, uh, you want, if you're going to be doing a more elaborate setup, right? Like where you have a camera and you have multiple audio recording sources, you also want to make sure that the camera is recording audio. And the reason for that is because we're going to use that audio to sync to the other audio sources. So it's really important that whatever camera you're using, even if it's the cheap built-in microphone over the camera, it doesn't matter. Make sure it's recording audio. It's really, really important. Otherwise, syncing the video is going to be a little bit of a nightmare later. Um, and then here's some uh, some advanced setting things for those of you that are thinking about using a mirrorless or DSLR. Um, Again, I prefer 24 frames per second. I think that looks better, but if you're going to use 24 or 30, um, with the shutter speed, you need the shutter speed to be double the frame rate, uh, to kind of make sure that the, the, um, uh, what's the word, uh, you want to make sure that the, the way that the picture looks, um, it, that it looks natural, right? So you need to double the frame rate. So if you're 24 frames per second, you want the shutter speed to be one fiftieth of a second. If, you, if you're at 30 frames per second, you want the shutter speed to be 1 60th. If for some reason you're, if you're going for, let's say 60 frames per second, then your shutter speed will need to be 1 over 120. So you just need to double it uh, for the denominator. Again, with the aperture, anywhere between F7 and F11. 11 is kind of like a sweet spot that I've found. Um, and then with the ISO, you can mess with the ISO. You can, you can actually, with a lot of near cameras, you can get the ISO quite a bit higher and it's going to look fine, you know? So like, depending on the camera that you have, if you're around ISO 4000, I think you'll be okay. You can definitely aim to go lower, but you should have some, some good wiggle room there. And then the last two things, again, focus manual, we talked about that, but also the white balance. Um, if your camera has a white balance setting, a lot of times it'll be set to auto white balance. And what, what will end up happening is your camera will have a, a spot where it's using to meter the color. And so whatever goes by that spot, it will constantly adjust the colors on the camera. 
So if you're in auto white balance mode. So what will end up happening is as you're watching the video, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but sometimes when you're watching somebody's video, you'll see like their background constantly changing. And that's because the white balance is on auto. So you just want to keep the white balance on manual. Great. Okay. The audio setup. Um, so if you're only using one point of audio, uh, for example, if you're just recording from your phone or you're just going to record with one set of mics, so you only have one zoom recorder, um, then probably your best bet is to just be in the stands, just record from the stands and, uh, balance your ensemble just like you would for a normal live performance. Right. So, um, don't get too far away for this because the further away you get, the more the room that you're going to capture. So you have to kind of find a good balance of this. You don't want to get too close because then you're going to miss stuff on the sides. But again, too far, you're going to get a lot of the room. Um, and I wouldn't worry about picking up the speakers so much. Like if anything, you probably want to get away from this, uh, get closer to the ensemble and let the speakers point away from the mics a little bit because otherwise you're going to have a hard time hearing the battery and all the other um, acoustic instruments. You're going to get a lot of speaker wash. If you're going to use two points of audio, um, for example, let's say you have two zoom recorders, uh, which is the way that I do it. Um, you'll put one where we just talked about kind of, you know, roughly 10 rows up in the stands. And then you'll put another one on your in your ensemble like right behind the front ensemble let's say you have a traditional setup where you have the battery you have the floor and then the front ensemble right on the front put the um, microphone right behind the front ensemble on the edge of the floor and that that zoom recorder is only going to pick up the battery right and so later you're going to mix the front of house sound with the battery sound and that way it'll get a lot more clarity with what the battery is doing um, and I'll show you an example of that in a little bit, but it, 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 and you're just doing this not necessarily to cheat, but you're doing this just so that your students can be heard, right? So they still have to play well. Um, all you're doing is you're trying to get what they're playing to not get swallowed in the largeness of your gym. Um, and then finally, uh, like we talked about before, you could, you know, it, depending on how technologically savvy you are with your mixing console, you could send a stereo uh, pair from your mixer into uh, the Zoom recorder or record it separately and then mix that in as well. For example, if, if you want to really get your synths, um, all of the soundscape, sound design, all of that stuff uh, clear in the mix, that might be a good way to do it. Um, Again, but we're still focusing on this is one performance. This is your student's performance. You're not necessarily piping in the audio later and producing it later, right? So you're trying to stay within the competitive sphere of this is your student's performance. So here's kind of a, just a rough not to scale <laughs> diagram. Um, but if if you're looking at your ensemble from a profile, right? Like if you're at the, the doors of your gym, um, this is kind of how I would think about this. So I, you've got your battery over here, um, then you've got your front ensemble, and then you would put a Zoom recorder or some other recording situation right here, um, right on the edge of the floor. Um, and I've found that like about, you know, chest height works really well. Uh, you don't want to get too high. Um, and you want to get too low. So about check, like, you know, kind of your normal, like if you were standing there, if you're the battery tech and you're standing on the edge of the floor, how do you hear your ensemble? So, so put it right around there. And then, um, so this is your main source of audio, the audio number one. And so that one wants to kind of capture the larger acoustic presence of your whole ensemble and a little bit of your synths and your speakers, right? So uh, for those of you that are familiar with like the WGI setup or where the judges sit, you've got, uh, for example, your music judges, and then you've got your GE judges and your visual judges in the back, right? You want the main source of audio to kind of be where the music judge would sit. So like kind of halfway up the stands, you don't want to go too far back. 
and you don't want to blast your speakers at that audio source. You want the speakers to actually go past it. Otherwise, um, you're going to lose a lot of clarity. And then finally, you've got your camera as far back as you can get so that you can see the whole ensemble. And then don't forget that camera needs to be recording audio as well so that we can sync everything up together. Uh, here's some recording tips. Um, you know, again, remember we talked about the audio being the most important part of this whole thing. Uh, check your audio levels like in rehearsal as you're kind of getting all this stuff set up. Um, you want to watch out for clipping, right? So like you want to know where the loudest point of your show is going to be and you need to set your audio gain so that it's not clipping on those super loud big moments. Um, and so basically you're going to find the, the loudest point and then you're going to check your recorder and as you're recording, you want the top of that to be anywhere between negative 10 and negative 4 dB when you're looking at the, the recorder. So for example, um, you can kind of see it on this, but um, you'll see these levels. There's a zero at the end, right? And so once it hits the zero, it's going to be too loud. So you want it to kind of be at your loudest point in your show be around here, right? Between like negative 12 and negative five on this picture. It's kind of hard to see, but you don't want it to go any higher than that. Otherwise you won't be able to recover it later. Um, and then finally, when you go to record, um, you can press record on everything at the same time. That would make your life way easier later when you're trying to sync everything. Obviously, you can't be everywhere at the same time. So, you know, for example, what I've done in the past is, you know, the recorder that I've got on the floor next to the battery, I'll just have the Xylo player like he knows because it's right next to him um, that he's going to hit record on that. And I'll say, OK, you know, Joey, ready? Here we go. And then we hit record at the same time because I'm up in the stands. Um, so and that, again, that's just to make your life easier when you go to sync. And when you're trying to sync everything, you're just moving stuff, you know, by millimeters. You're not trying to, like, find where you're starting on each file. Uh, the, the next logical thing from that, though, is you'll need a sync point. Um, and so if you guys, you know, you watch uh, behind the scenes footage on movies, you've got the guy that comes out with the big slate and they, you know, here we go. Scene one, whatever. The reason they do that is so that you have a very clear visual and point of sound that all of the different recording uh, devices can see. And so that later when you go to sync this up, you can see, for example, I'll just have, you know, the snare drummer before we start the run through, he'll just play one really big note, like reach up in the sky and play one big note. And so when I see that waveform of the recorded audio, I see a big spike on it. And when I go into the video, I see the snare drummer reach up. And when he hits, I know that that waveform needs to line up with the frame of when he's hitting. And and this is at the beginning of your recording. So it's like once that's synced, everything else is going to be totally synced up. Um, and then, you know, finally check all your batteries and memory cards. I know that sounds silly, but how many times I've messed that up? It's pretty amazing. <laughs> So just, you know, double check all your batteries and memory cards. Um, that's an easy one. The thing with the drone is don't you don't want to go too high. Um, the higher you get, the just harder it becomes to see everything. And so the way that I think about the drone is not necessarily that it can fly, but it's that it you can position it anywhere you want. Right. So the best case scenario is to be in a gym and to be, you know, maybe 30 feet up in the air, but like. 10 feet back. Well, no gym can do that. And so a drone can, right? So with the drone, I can get higher without getting too far back. And so for me personally, recording rehearsal footage outside with a drone uh, ends up being an amazing tool for the students, but you can see everything on the floor. You can see your floor design. Whereas a lot of times you're in the gym and you're standing where the GE judge is, and for whatever reason, your printed floor has a big glare on it from the lights, right? Or the angle that you're at, you can't see everything on the floor. And it's like all that time and energy you spent doing all this great visual design, and you can't see any of it. And that's 
you know, this is a great opportunity if you are comfortable with the drone and you're comfortable with rehearsing outside uh, to get a, an amazing vantage point. So for an example, um, this is a rehearsal footage uh, from a Broken City rehearsal from a few years ago. Um, and this is, for me, a, is an ideal vantage point. Um, most, you know, you normally wouldn't get to experience WGI from this vantage point. And so I think that, but what you do end up seeing with a view like this is awesome because I can see every single member. I can see exactly what each member is doing. I can see the way that the visual is functioning. I can see everyone's dots. I can see the floor design. I can see all the props. I mean, so to me personally, this is like an ideal representation of how I want people to experience what my students are doing. And so in a way, it's like embrace this virtual opportunity, right? Because normally you're limited to the way people experience your product because they're sitting in a gym that you don't know anything about. But now you can control people's experience of your product in a way, right? And so I think that this is a great thing. So what I wanted to do, I'm going to show you a little bit of a video clip from, from this rehearsal to kind of give you a sense of what all of these different um, tips kind of allude to. Um, and if you notice, it's kind of hard to see on the picture, but there's a little, uh, you'll see on a little stand, there's a zoom recorder right here. Um, and then I had, I was flying the drone and then probably the, the other zoom recorder that recorded the audio of the entire thing is probably, you know, 15 feet in front of the pit, um, just on another, another stand. And if you notice right here, you'll see the speaker, the speaker is just pointing like normal. It's not pointing into the recorder but you'll still be able to hear everything. You'll hear all the audio from the synths. And I didn't pipe in any other electronics into the recording. It's literally just two audio feeds. Uh, so I'll play this video real quick. My hope with that recording is like, A, you could see everything that was happening visually. Uh, you could experience the performance energy and quality of what the students were doing with, with clarity. And the audio presentation, uh, and that, I mean, that wasn't a perfect rep. You know, that was a rehearsal. It was, you know, in the middle of the season. So obviously that we have some work to do, but hopefully the quality of the audio gives the listener an opportunity to hear what's happening, right? And it's not necessarily, it's so perfect and I've, I've fixed it. It's just, are you experiencing what these students are doing at that moment in time? You're not trying to make perfect. You're just trying to make a recording of what your students are doing in that moment. It's really about being able to share the performance in a way that everyone can get credit for what they're doing, right? Or get feedback on what they're doing if, if they're not doing it well either, right? But if if you just took a cell phone video from the stands and all you heard was the reverb of the gym, well, I, I know that that's not the ideal case scenario. And as as an observer, it's like, well, I want to I want to give it up to those kids. I just can't hear what they're doing, right? And um, you know. Even for WGI, we've we've done um, class classification, and so people submit videos and say, you know, are we in the right class? And when we watch the video, and it's like, well, I can't tell anything because the it's just audio from the room, right? And so what we're trying to do is create an opportunity to give your students the ability to share what they're doing in a clear way. So for, at Arcadia, we have a 
a, a room where basically the floor can fit and the pit can fit. And then we have like three feet of room before the wall. And that's where the staff stands. And so what we've done in that situation is um, you want to try to get height with your microphones if you can. Right. So get something that will go up higher. Um, and then the other thing you can do is if you if you have access to two recorders, you could still put a recorder on the floor like we talked about for the battery and for the pit instead of putting the recorder in the right in front of like let's say your center marimba put the recorder like on the outskirt like near the speaker so that you're getting um audio of the whole ensemble or the whole front ensemble coming out of the speaker like 50 percent, and then the other 50 percent is getting like the audio from the rest of the front ensemble like at an angle uh, and then try to go up higher if you can. Um, I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but like this way, it, it will at least help you from only getting that center marimba, right? Like if you have the speaker and you're all mic'd up, the speaker is actually mixing all that audio. And then like the last thing you could do is like we talked about is you can mic up your front ensemble like you normally do. It's going into the mixer and then you just record the feed from the mixer and then you can lay that on top of your battery zoom recorder. So that would probably be like, I would try to play with those two options if I was in that position. You know, once everything's recorded and you've got all your files and they're all organized, you know, the next thing that you need to do is not the video. The next thing you need to do is actually take, you know, your one, two or three different audio mixes and you need to combine them um, and line them all up, right? And so you can see on this picture, basically what I've done is I've got the three different audio feeds and I'll get in there, I'll zoom in and you can kind of see all these little peaks and valleys. And I really try to make sure that I'm lining that up. Um, now again, if you were smart and you had that sync point at the very beginning, then you would see one big spike uh, and then a, a bunch of silence, right? And so you would just try to line up that one spike. And then the next step after that that I take is I will go through and, um, you know, a lot of audio software will have automation. And basically what I'm doing is I'm just making minor adjustments to, to each track. Uh, I'm not going in there and like fixing things. All I'm doing is just like gentle adjustment of volume um, to kind of deal with the circumstance of what was happening, right? So for example, let's say there's a battery moment and um, it sounds fine on the main recording, but like one tenor player is like right next to that front mic, right? Like because of your drill or whatever. Well, that front mic is not going to sound really good. It's not, it's going to sound like a tenor player. It's not going to sound like a battery. So maybe in that instance, you're bringing down the levels of that one spot. Um, or for example, you might have a section that's a battery moment and they're like right in the middle of the floor being recorded perfectly on the main battery mic, well, you don't necessarily want the further mic with all the boominess of the gym uh, to be contributing as much. So you might turn that down, right? So really, I'm just going through and in my head, I'm trying to say, how can I mix these things so that people can hear what my students are doing, right? And I think that's important. It's not how can I fix this so I make my students sound better than they are. It's how can I fix this so that people can hear what my students are doing. And then finally, once you have uh, that, all those audio tracks, you've got it mixed how you want, then you would export that as one audio track. And then you would move everything into your video editing software. And then you've got your, you know, when you're looking at the software, you've got your video track and the video track will probably have its own audio track. And then you'll have this new track that you just mixed. You'll drop that in and then you'll need to line that up, right? So remember, if we have that sync point, it'll be super easy to line up. If your video didn't record audio, then this is where it becomes scary because now you have to physically look at every frame and figure out where the kids, what you see is lining up with what, what you hear. So again, remember, the the video track needs its own audio for for you to save some some of your life and then once you've got it synced up then you just delete or mute the audio track that was built into the video um, so that way what you see is the video and what you hear is your mixed audio from all three or two sources 
And then finally, you know, just trim the video. You take out the moment where your center snare hit the big rim shot. You take out the ending and just trim it up, make it look good, and then export the finished product. Yeah, so that's kind of the end of the 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 broader like nitty gritty of of all those three steps right and so the next section that i wanted to kind of get into was just some, like design considerations so what i did was i just uh put together a bunch of different considerations that kind of uh came to me not only for designing for a virtual performance but also thinking about design in a live setting as well right so let's just kind of hit some of these um density of sound so this is a big one for me personally. It's, it, you know, this, this activity is, is a loud activity, especially for drums. Um, you know, winds, I think maybe are, are probably a little bit more sensitive to this, but for drum lines, you know, you go to a show and you watch 30 groups in a row and your ears are blown out. So this is a very loud activity. And so from a design perspective, I think that if you, understand that that you can approach your design aesthetic with your ensemble and you can actually like be a soothing moment in a judge's life you know and and in the audience's life on that day right and so think about how much density of sound you want in your program and you know it's it's not going to be that effective if it's sustained and constant right it's just going to feel like you're shouting all the time so are there ways that you can clamp down on this especially in a gym right because everything you do in a gym triples in the volume so really picking and choosing those moments and and then accounting for the decay of those sounds right so if you have a really big loud moment the next four or five seconds the sound is clearing in the room the sound is clearing in your ears your be you're reorienting yourself to what's happening so like let the moment immediately after a really big moment let that next part like gently get you ready for the next thing that you're going to hear so density of sound is a big one for me um and i think that that's something that a lot of groups overlook um the next point i put down is uh, create depth over articulation and that's kind of talking about uh amplification in general um you know, as we start amplifying every single potential instrument in the front ensemble and you actually stand in front of the speakers or you get further away from the speakers, what you hear coming out of the speakers, uh, I think a lot of people treat it as if they want to hear what's coming out of the speakers uh, in a vacuum, right? Like if you recorded everything your front ensemble was doing and then put your headphones on and listen to it, like a studio recording, I think that's what people are trying to approach amplification like. And I think that what you what you should be thinking about is the speakers, what's coming out of the speakers is contributing to the acoustic sound that is already there as well, right? So you've got the sound of the battery, then you've got the sound of the front ensemble, and then you've got the sound that's coming out of the speakers all combined to make the experience for the audience member. And I think if you start to think of it like this way, you, like hopefully some light bulbs will go off because then you start thinking about, okay, well, for example, the mallet selection that I, I choose for my front ensemble, that's so I can hear it clearly acoustically. And it's not necessarily so that I can take that acoustic articulation and pipe it through the speakers. The speakers are just projecting the body of the sound or the depth or whatever it is that you want it to project. They're not necessarily meant to project the, the ticky attack, right, of the mallet. So, you know, just like thinking about it that way might make the experience a little bit more pleasant for the listener who's further away, namely the judge. Um, and I'm not sure if anyone has thought about it like that, but I think it might help. Like when I see ensembles, it, it what's coming out of the speakers ends up being really harsh. It, it ends up being uh, not pleasant to listen to. And I think it ends up, I was trying to put my finger on what that is. And I think it is 
you're hearing a lot of harsh attack when you don't need it to. You just want to hear resonance and warmth coming out of the speakers. And really, you want to hear the lushness of your sound design and your synths uh, and let the acoustic keyboards do a good amount of work and then let the amplification of those keyboards be helped by the speakers, but not you're not letting the speakers do the work for you for the acoustic stuff. I hope some of that makes sense. Um, the next tip I have is marching versus movement. Um, from a design perspective, a lot of times I'll see people doing uh, like drill um, with students that aren't playing, right? Like they're just, you know, I got to move this symbol, you know, from here to here, you know, 10 feet in 24 counts. So they're going to take, you know, 24 three inch steps to get to the spot, um, which is fine. But I guess I would I would say is there a more creative way for for them to get from point A to point B that is maybe more artistic or that is maybe contributing to the identity of your show um, or that is some way of moving that, you know, if you don't want it to be a distraction, then, well, that is distracting if they're like just iterating 24 little steps, right? So and this is like a very kind of minor point, but I see it a lot is just like drill for the sake of drill instead of just saying, well, if you got to go from here to there, why don't you just go there and then and then either not move or, you know, take instead of 24 little steps, take three long steps and get there creatively. Um, so that's kind of a, a little interesting nugget to, to kind of put your brain on visually. Um, the next consideration I want to kind of hit, um, I know this is all like really free form. So, you know, I'd love to have any questions, uh, if uh, anyone has them, but, um, I'm just kind of going free form here. Um, ends of phrases with ends of phrases, uh, this kind of goes back to the density point, but you know, are you considering how you end each phrase, um, over the course of your program, right? So if, for example, your show has, um, you know, start soft and kind of gets big and then has a big impact and then there's like a big drop off and then it starts slow and gets big and it has a big impact and then there's a drop off and then you do that three times, right? So I guess my question to you would be, is that the desired effect three times in a row? Are each of those peaks, you know, supposed to be the same energy and intensity? Um, is maybe, could you take the second peak and sustain it and come out of it as opposed to going to silence? Um, you know, maybe one impact ends on a, ends on like a vacuum and the other impact ends on like a big symbol, symbol gong, bass drum. Um, just trying to like have more variety. Cause I think a lot of people will create variety when it comes to textures, they'll create variety when it comes to like artistic choices and musical choices and costuming and props and, sh and show theme. Like there's a lot of variety and interest there. But then if you watch 20 or 30 groups in a row, there's like very limited variety when it comes to the ends of phrases. And especially in the drumline activity, there's there's kind of like a formula. It's like you, you know, you play a big roll, a big shot and a big bass drum gong. And then, you know, and that's great. It's very energetic. But, you know, I guess I would challenge everyone to say, OK, well, are there other ways to, to do some of that? And I think it could lead to some interesting conversations with your design team if you start to notice those kinds of things and say, wait, how many of those do we have in our show? Um, if we have five, OK, well, can the second and the fourth one be slightly different so that you create a, a unique identity across all of your, you know, ends of phrases. Um, props. Um, I think this goes for live and for recorded. You know, if you've got props where students are going to hide behind them, uh, it's interesting because I think a lot of times people will run their rehearsals from like standing like right in front of the, you know, center marimba maybe. And when it looks like, you know, the bass drums are behind the prop, it looks like it to you, 
But if you're looking from where the GE judge is sitting or the visual judge is sitting or where the camera is going to be, you realize that they're actually not hidden. And so um, this is a minor point, but it ends up being a distraction. And especially if you're going to record it, it's like, wait, why you didn't watch the video before you sent it? You know, so <laughs> these are kind of the little details that like it, it, it might be easy to kind of overlook it. But um, think about that whenever you're hiding people behind props. It's like they need to really be hidden. And I can't tell you how many times I've been judging a show and it's so distracting that it's like because it's 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 two levels of distracting because you see like, oh, here go the bass drums. They're going to up. Oh, they're going to go away. They're going behind the prop. And wait, I could still see them. So your eye is drawn to that person as they're running behind the prop. And then you still see them. And so it's like this double whammy that I don't think people think about where it's like I was trying to hide the bass drums. But what you actually did is the opposite. Now I see them instead of just like, well, why don't you just, you know, bass drums like kneel down, take a knee, face back field. Like that's not distracting at all. Like they're, you know, they became a prop now and I didn't watch them go somewhere else. So it's like, um, I hate to come off sounding like an old man, but get off my lawn kind of thing. But it's it is one of those things where you you don't mean to do something and it turns into a thing, especially if you're on the judge's side of things. Right. Like and it's not the kind of thing like if I was a judge, I probably wouldn't give you a big hard time about it. But in the back of my head, I'm, it's like a, it's kind of like a big negative you know what I mean? It might be the kind of thing that a lot of judges are too nice to say to you. And so, yeah, that's the benefit I'm bringing to all of you today is I'm not going to be too nice. <laughs> um, speaker angles. So speaker angles. Um, I, I see a lot of groups uh, when I go into a show. Um, and this, I think, works both for live and for recorded. Um, I'll, I'll see this like if I'm, for example, if I'm where the GE judge is sitting, they'll the speaker angles will either be pointing right at me or pointing like into the middle of the audience and goes back to the other discussion that we had. It's like, remember, you've got the acoustic sound of your students and then you've got the amplified sound. When you point the speakers right into the middle of the floor or at the judge, you're saying that the amplified sound is way more important than any of the acoustic sound. And it makes it very difficult to listen to your ensemble, especially if your speakers are like, I mean, if you're piping a good amount of sound, it just is a ma major distraction slash negative. So I would err on the side of, you know, the way that I tell my students when they set up the speakers, imagine you've got a big box, right? Like, you know, like your high school press box and you want, let's say, you know, Let's say I'm I'm looking at the left speaker. I want to point it so that the inside edge of the speaker is lined up with the outside edge of the press box. If that makes any sense. So the side of the speaker that's pointing into the middle of the floor, that line is lined up with the walls of the press box. And so that way the speaker sound is going past on the side and it's not hitting me in the face and it, it gives me a chance to hear the ensemble and hear the speakers at the same time and not not get powered by one um winds uh I th this one is is really you know if you're using wind instruments in your um in your percussion ensemble or if you're doing a winds ensemble i, I think especially band directors you guys are going to know this that like the balance and blend ends up being like the number one issue that you're dealing with at all times, especially if you're trying to balance um, the acoustic sound of your winds within the different environments, right? Like whether you're outside rehearsing or you're in your band room and then you're rehearsing in a new gym or then you go to the show and everything sounds different and you're constantly trying to teach your students how to play a certain way and how to play with a certain tone and how to play with a certain blend within each other. And then it's immediately when you change the environment, everything that you just spent hours and hours working on goes out the window because now you're in a new gym and, you know, I told the, the saxes to play at this volume and they did and it just didn't work in the room that I was in. So, there's there's a way to approach this like there's a couple different things that you can do 
Number one is teach your students how to be flexible and be aware of the environment that they're going in, right? And rehearsing in multiple environments, right? So for example, if you're always rehearsing in your band room and all of a sudden you have a performance outside, the students, like they're going to experience all that space that, and it's going to freak them out. Or if, if you're always rehearsing outside and it's super dry, and then all of a sudden you have to go perform in a really boomy gym, their personal experience, they're not used to that and they don't know what to do to make it sound good or, or feel good. So really the only way to do that is to try to rehearse in different environments and say, okay, look, you know, this Saturday we have a performance at this gym and that gym ends up being really boomy. So we're going to go rehearse in the cafeteria. And so you get a sense of what it feels like and how much you need to listen and how much you need to project in this boomy environment, right? Or, Hey, tomorrow we're going to go perform, you know, at the UD arena. It's a really dry uh, venue. So we're going to practice outside. So you get a chance to see what it feels like when you're playing and there's a lot of open space and air and every sound that you make just gets, you know, is really dry. You don't hear the person next to you that well. So um, find different environments for your students to, to perform in and they'll be way better equipped when you when you get into a surprise situation. Uh, the next point I put down is um, wind miking um, to embrace creativity. I think it's something that we haven't seen very much of in this activity yet. And so if you're looking to find ways to be interesting uh, with either using winds in your percussion show or, you know, having soloists in your winds group, um, you know, I think most people will, you know, mic up their soloist, put a little bit of reverb on it, make it sound beautiful. And it's like, okay, great. We're ready to go. Well, is there an opportunity in your design to experiment with moments that have like extreme reverb that has a lot of effects or artifacts on it, or maybe some uh, unique uh, filtration, or can, can we play really long sustains and then when they change notes because of the bleed of the reverb, it creates a harmony, right? Like, I think there's ways to play with that and build that into your design idea because that's going to be super memorable. Like you'll be able to create a moment in your show that is different than anybody else's just because you took the time to play with an idea that a lot of people are not playing with. So just kind of throwing it out there, performing for a live audience uh, versus an empty room. Right. And so a lot of people will design their show like, and you're thinking about your finals performance, right? You've got a, everyone's in the stands and they're cheering for you and you're going on last and the house is packed and it's a lot of energy. You get to the end of that big impact and the battery shot, big bass drum gong and the crowd goes wild. For most people though, that is not the, for most ensembles, that is not the experience that they have when they're performing their show, right? Especially if you're a smaller ensemble and you're going on at, you know, 1.15 in the afternoon and there's, you know, maybe your parents are in the stands and they're, they're your best fans, but there's not really that many people there. And you get to that end of that big impact and you hit that last note and there's not really much happening in the stands, right? Like how, how do you prepare your students for that? Or how do you design your show that doesn't create that awkward silence at the end of a big impact? And so one thing that I've always done is for groups that are like a class, um, I almost never create those kind of moments because I just know that my students for better or worse are never going to perform in an environment in which they're going to get that, you know, independent world finals night reaction from anybody. And so I don't let them hit a big note and stand and look at the audience awkwardly. Like it's just not in the show. Like there is no moment for them to do that because a, they're not going to get any applause, even if they play amazingly, it's just, it's just reality. And so you just like those little, it's like a little weird thing, but at the same time, when you're judging, you see this in the 28 class groups that perform that day. And it, it just creates this weird, awkward feeling. Right. But then when a group comes by, and they have variety to the end of their phrases. They don't create 
create awkward moments for their students. Like it just translates into like professionalism. It, it's like something unique and memorable that that you end up noticing. It's like, oh wow, they really they really thought about this because yeah, like there is nobody in the audience and they didn't just stand there to create this moment, you know? And and then now, especially if you're going to record this live, let's say you are doing a kind of show that that has that high energy moment, right? Well, maybe the recording that you're going to send, at least maybe for your final competition, you know, if, if your school allows it, like maybe you do perform for your parents socially distanced in the stands and maybe the live recording that you're going to submit you know has that element so that the students are performing they're they're being they're emoting to actual real people they're creating an experience that that's going to translate on camera rather than just performing you know for you the director holding their camera up it's going to be a little bit of a different feeling for your students um now obviously that this is all going to depend on you know all health and safety things but Thinking about these things, I think, will be a benefit for your students, right? Whether it's you can you create a parent performance or can you find a way to alter your design for the recorded performance versus the live performance, right? Like maybe you guys are having some live performances and you do have that moment of impact. But then you tell the students, OK, plan B for the recording, like plan B, we're not going to wait for four bars at the end of this note. We're going to hit the last note and it's going to be, you know, two counts and you're in just so that you're removing some of those awkward, you know, real life things for the recording. Um, the next bullet, training the students for live performance logistics. That was something I kind of threw in there because I don't know what your circumstances are in terms of like, is everyone doing virtual only? Are you doing some virtual? Are you doing some in person? But one thing I would say is um, we spend a lot of time training our students for like that NASCAR element of of this activity. Right. Like you have to get into the gym. You got to, you know, everyone has their jobs of plugging stuff in. Uh, who's putting the floor out? Who's going out? Like. I would still want to train my students how to do that, because I know when I do come back to normal, that that needs to be a part of the culture of the program. Like I need vets that know how to do that stuff. So I'm just curious how many of you actually will still train your students for those logistics, even if you're just doing a virtual only season. Um, and I would encourage you to, you know, use an opportunity to say, hey, look, on Saturday, we're going to record our performance for virtual but we're also going to practice getting in and out of the gym because two Saturdays from now we have to do this live. And so we're still going to do all of those things that we would normally do live. We didn't neglect it because we're only doing one live performance because, you know, for, for most of, you know, like if, if your logistics go well, your students can have a great performance. If the logistics have a hiccup in it, it, it really has the ability to throw a big wrench in their experience. And so, um, I would definitely recommend still allocating time and energy to train your ensemble for logistics. Uh, symbol wash, you know, I think this, this is, again, this might be another, um, another thing about just being very careful and considerate that with this activity gets really loud. Like, do you really need in this moment all 12 keyboard instruments using both mallets to play as loud as they possibly can on their cymbal. Um, and I only, and I totally get like the visual aspect of making that happen. Is there a way to do it and have the students recognize like, okay, look, all 12 of you are hitting the cymbal. So you don't need to kill it. Right. You, we're just going to, we're going to make it look really cool. It's going to be this big visual impact, but you don't need to try to break it. All right. And because it's, I don't know if people think about those things, but as a judge, it's just it very like distracting is the wrong word, but it is a slap in the face when you have that much symbol attack, when you're really trying to hear what the battery is doing, like the symbols are just adding color, right? But it ends up being like all frosting and no cake. And so be really judicious about how much symbol sound uh, you want coming out of the front ensemble. And then on top of that, if your speakers are pointing at me and your mics are on, now those 12 symbols are going through the speakers 
uh, through the mics, out the speakers, right into me. And I can't even hear, I can't appreciate anything that your battery is doing. So be really conscious of your symbols. Um, pacing considerations, uh, the live versus recorded. Uh, this Some of this we talked about before with the performing for a live audience. Um, but really the pacing considerations I would really think about is finding ways to make this feel more seamless and less like productions that start and stop. But like, are there ways that it can feel like a, a through idea? Um, because as an audience member, it's one thing you know, to watch something without anybody else around, right? If, if you're in a show and you're sitting there and you've got your family around you and you're enjoying the show and you're kind of, there's other things to experience. But when you're watching something on a screen, there's nobody else here. I'm just looking at the screen. And so even a second, I, like if I, if I did that, it like you're like, wait, what, what did you just do? Why did you just stop for one second? Like the fact that you're looking at my face right now and and it's in private, it creates this awkward moment, just that one second, right? Which doesn't happen when you're live. And so, you know, just being aware of those kind of things that you know you're going to record this thing and there might be awkward spaces in your show that may not be a problem when you're just performing this live. Um, and then finally, if all you're doing is live, I, I hope that this, you know, this, uh, workshop on recording can still be a benefit to you because um, the last few years as I've been recording my ensemble more and more um, on a regular basis, A, it made me better at recording and get faster with my workflow. And I feel like when someone says, hey, can we make a recording of rehearsal tonight? It's not a big deal. I, I can just do it. And then on top of that, like this, you know, I'm able to get my students a recording like on a regular basis and they really a, it's a great experience for them because they could see all of the hard work that they're putting in because like your students don't really get to see what they're doing, right? Like it's it's this weird paradigm. Like you get to enjoy what they're doing all the time and they only see their own little experience of it. They never get to see what you see. And so, um, you know, if I can uh, suggest that everyone record as much as they possibly can, that it, it, it creates a really cool uh, experience for your students. And then the last point I put down is be memorable, um, you know, like find a way. Think about that poor judge that's sitting there for, you know, 12 hours watching video after video after video. Um, how can what can you do to stand out in their mind? You know, whether it's uh, having some kind of element in your show that is really compelling visually or musically. Maybe there is some student that is so amazing that you feature them, that they become memorable. But, you know, if someone could watch your show, I always ask myself this. If I if I watch my show and then three years later ask myself, wait, what was that show about? Could I remember that? Right. Like if 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 you can do that, it will actually help you get out of like the weeds of like every single, you know, choice that you've made and really start thinking about wait what is this show what are we doing what is the identity and if, if you know if a parent or a student was able to look back in time and say hey what was that show about what would they think of and that is your memorable thing right and so in, invest some time and energy in figuring out what is that memorable thing what is the thing that when someone walks away from the competition or from the season or from the school year, how would they encapsulate their experience of the show? And whatever that thing you come up with is, then double down on that and really like really make that shine and be special. And um, everything else is just, you know, it's a distraction. <laughs> so really try to be memorable, find that thing and, and really double down on it.